My name is Mallory Jarena. My major is Hospitality Administration with a focus in travel and tourism. And I chose SFA because of the community and the atmosphere, having a close personal relationship with the professors really stood out to me. I chose hospitality as my major because I wanted to be able to share Texas with other people and visitors, and hospitality was the way I was able to achieve that. What I like most about Nacogdoches is the small community, the atmosphere, and the friendliness of everyone in the community. I would recommend SFA to my friends because of the friendliness of the professors. The class sizes are small. You get to know your classmates, especially within the majors. Everyone's been together for so long. It's just a big family. As always, Axum Jacks. Great to see everybody here. Welcome to Nacogdoches, Steve F. Austin State University. This is our very first panel. I need your help on a few things. One, uh, when we start our programs, let's get everybody to make their way into the room. I'm about to, when we get this thing started, I'm going to go shoot everybody else in here. We want to have a big crowd today. We've got a great program. And we're starting off today with an issue that we talked about with the Lone Star Legislative Summit. We said, what are some things we can talk about that are topical, that are timely, that are important uh, to Texas, but to this region? And uh, one of the issues that we talked about with the chamber staff here was the tourism industry. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, of course we all know the role of energy, uh, the energy sector in Texas being the leading uh, uh, economic driver of our economy, but the second largest uh, economy in Texas is the tourism industry. Uh, and, it, and many factors of that. So hopefully some of you last night stayed at the uh, new Hotel Fredonia, the new old Hotel Fredonia, uh, which is there because of our uh, uh, great uh, leader, uh, leaders, uh, Richard Barber DeWitt, and also the uh, hotel occupancy tax bill we passed in the 84th legislature. Thank you, members, for doing that. Uh, but when you talk about tourism, you talk about the economy of people staying in hotels, driving to places, going to things, enjoying uh, the, the things that are Texas. There are so many things that we can do here and that we can enjoy. People want to be in Texas. I say this all the time. Inside every American, there's a Texan trying to get out. And this is the place that people want to live. And there's nobody we could have better to lead us in this discussion than David Teal. He is the president and CEO of the Texas Travel Industry Association. Uh, he is not from a town called Mexia. He's from a town called Mejia. Uh, those of us from Texas would know that. A sixth generation Texan, uh, he and his wife Frankie have been married for more than 30 years, make their home in Austin, have two children and four grandchildren. I'm going to take a moment of privilege here to say that uh, I'm now a granddad. For the second time in four months, uh, little Liam is in the, the Upper East Side of New York, and, and uh, uh, Jackson is now in Fort Worth from about a week ago. Uh, he is a, uh, uh, he's definitely a, a Clardy boy. He was 8 pounds, 13 ounces at birth and is about this long and uh, but he's uh, growing well and doing fine uh, but it, it's great to, to have them in Texas and uh, but but it's even better to be here this morning and let's talk about the travel industry and what it means we have a hospitality school here at the university uh, last night if you were at the hotel for our opening ceremonies many of our hospitality students were there working on the at the, at the hotel and doing those things. Uh, it's an important thing for us. And so let's all be hospitable in our welcoming of David Teal, who's gonna moderate the panel on Texas tourism. David. Well, the uh, accurate pronunciation, not to correct you, is Mahayer. <laughs> and you know, just so we have that technically there. Um, I'm very thrilled to be here today. Um, as Representative Clardy said, inside every American is a Texan screaming to get out. We're doing all the screaming in travel and tourism. That's what we do. We love, I get to go to work every day and brag about what I do and brag about where I live and brag about communities like Nacogdoches. And these folks we're about to introduce can help us make, do that very, very well and effectively and they have over a long, a long time. Um, I had... A list of all of them up here. Well, why don't you guys come on up and I'll find my list and then we'll introduce you after you get seated. This is our panel this morning. I was a little... Perfect. That's all right. Thank you. 
<laughs> You'd have gotten more value out of this. I'm, um, I'm not certain. It looks like uh, Senator Brandon Creighton it will not be able to join us today. I haven't gotten word yet on Senator Kokorst, whether she's going to make it or not. But in no particular order, we're going to start with State Representative Ernest Bales, uh, who's District 18. Um, his uh, district represents a lot of the area around um, Lake Livingston and Huntsville. And there's a lot going on over there. He's going to enjoy telling us a lot about that as well. Uh, State Representative John Frulo is Chairman of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism Committee. He's very important for us and our industry um, as, as uh, we work through the legislative session. One of the newer members of the legislature, State Representative Barbara Gervin Hawkins, also a Cultural, Recreation, and Tourism uh, Committee member. I failed to mention Chairman Frulo is from the Lubbock area. Uh, Representative Gervin Hawkins from San Antonio. Um, Representative Craig Goldman, uh, near second from the end, uh, it's from the uh, Fort Worth area. And then next, seated next to him is State Representative Tan Parker. Both of those folks have been just really good supporters of travel and tourism in Texas. So please join me one more time giving these folks a great welcome to be here today. Um, as I've explained to and tried to, I hope, communicate to the panelists, I think we'd like to have more of an open conversation today on various topics and issues that impact how we do grow this industry that we call travel and tourism in Texas. Um, and I hope we're all engaged. I hope you guys are engaged. I think if you have questions during this session, raise your hand. We have someone here who will bring you a card. Over there they are. You write your question down, they'll bring it back up. We'll pose that to the panel uh, as we get further into, into the session. We have 60 minutes, and there's five legislators. <laughs> if we get beyond Perfect. question two, well, no, I'm just kidding. But um, I would tell you a little bit about uh, the Texas Travel Industry Association. We are the umbrella organization for travel and tourism in Texas. Our membership includes about 700, give or take, uh, organizations and businesses across the state that comprise every sector of travel and tourism that you can imagine. Um, we have big communities, small communities, CBBs, chambers, economic development councils, private sector, public sector, airlines, sports teams, theme parks, it, it goes on and on. Um, it's a lot like herding cats sometimes in my job because we have such a diverse industry, it's just as diverse as the state. Um, but it's also a very productive industry, and it has a very important footprint on the economy of Texas. Um, as Representative Clardy mentioned, uh, the travel and tourism industry is the second largest export industry behind only oil and gas. Um, and it impacts every community in Texas. Uh, one of the big challenges I had growing up in Mahia, Texas, is as I go back now in my current role, I often ask, what is there to do here? And not just Mahia, but in a lot of communities, you get the answer, nothing or not much, or I don't know. The very fact that I stopped and asked you a question means you're engaged with a tourist. So that's an opportunity. We'll talk a little bit about those as we move forward. This industry uh, has, has a significant economic impact on the state. $69 billion, direct travel spending, no multipliers in that. That's just money spent by people who come to our communities and spend their dollars with our businesses. 664,000 direct jobs. If you consider what the indirect jobs are, those folks who also have a job because there's a tourism presence in their community, put those together, direct and indirect, you have about 1.1 million jobs. Um, and that activity generates significant tax revenue for our state and local governments, over almost six and a half billion dollars in state and local tax revenues. One of the things I like to tell most about travel and tourism is that without the visitors that come to our communities, every Texas household would have an additional $650 in tax liability every year. <clears throat> so having a visitor to your community lowers your tax obligation, raises the standard of living in your community, and they get to go away. So you get to keep their money, they get to go home. It's a win-win for everybody uh, that uh, is involved. Um, so you guys are ready. 
Why don't we just jump right on in and, and get started with the topic. This was a question I really had for Senator Kohlkorst and Senator um, Creighton, but since they're not here, I'm going to direct it to Chairman Freeland. Um, focus today is how do we make, how do we grow travel and tourism, but a very important sector of that economy has been hugely negatively impacted by something called Harvey recently. And I know your committee has uh, purview over a lot of state agencies, particularly like Parks and Wildlife. There are, there's, there are state assets that have been put at risk because of that. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that's impacted that segment of the tourism industry in the state? and where we're going to go from here with, with Harvey and how that's going to impact the session coming up. Sure, David. I want to thank you for uh, moderating this panel. Uh, I think we've got all pretty good guys without the, no, no offense, Senator, without the senators here, so it'll go rather smoothly. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, appreciate that. And, of course, Travis, uh, thank you and Senator Nichols for putting this on. I think one of the things I want to talk about first is just what uh, Nacogdoches has done for tourism and travel and just the time I've been here. The, the first, this is the third uh, one of these uh, summits, the uh, great summits that I've been to. The first one, I was sleeping in a barn on a cot, and now I got this beautiful uh, hotel this last time. So, you know, they're, they're, they're recognizing what to do and what to attract people. And uh, I, I think probably part of that was you got clarity out of the hotel management side of it, and so it worked out uh, rather well. I think that uh, in, in talking to Harvey, yeah, that was just, uh, you know, the one in a hundred uh, year storm. We're looking at what uh, what that has done, and uh, prior to being chair of uh, culture, recreation, and tourism, and of course, if you uh, haven't been able to tell, they put me on that uh, for the culture side. Uh, but uh, <laughs> before that, I was on insurance, and so we had worked with with yeah. insurance and what all is happening there. Some recent numbers that we had was 15 billion dollars in. Uh, losses as far as Hurricane Harvey. And you start looking about it, and of course all of us think about, well, where we're, what, what happens, what, what goes on. Ernest is looking at, well, what all the rain and the problems that it caused up in the hill country where he is from. And uh, we look at different things and the, uh, the effect that it has on the whole state. And, and you look at the state and the diverse tourism activity that we have, the different type of activities that we have, a lot of different areas. Uh, you, you get down to the Gulf Coast. I saw Larry here earlier, or, or uh, you know, last night, and uh, you, you look at what's happening with the, the shrimp population, the oysters. How do we make sure that those rebound? That's huge industries. So they've got uh, you know their own ecosystems there with all that fresh water. Uh, there could be a lot of losses there. What do we do from? Uh, Parks and wildlife perspective, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make that uh, get back to where it was as quickly as we can? Well, some of that may be limiting the activity that goes on. Uh, you know, we've seen some uh, slowdown, stopping of fishing, uh, different items. So each area, the, the parks and wildlife sustained a lot of damage, in part from the activity of the hurricane, but also from people. They were taking a care of additional people that were there at the parks, and they were over, overloading the parks, the restroom facilities. Uh, and, and so we've got to get those repaired and fixed, and it's how do we do it? Well, it's all, it, every, it, with, like with everything in the state, it takes time and it takes money. And uh, so we have to figure out what is the best way, how is the federal government going to help all this money that we've paid in taxes all these years, what is happening there, uh, flood insurance, what's happening with FEMA. There's just a lot of different activities. And then the, the private sector, how are they uh, able to rebuild? You look at the tourism areas of like Rockport, you know, that, that, that looks like a moonshot right after that happened. Hotels down, hotels that we've all stayed at in that area uh, or, you know, torn apart, uh, difficult to get rooms. Uh, you know, how do you rebuild that activity? And then of course, how do you get the uh, message out when it's rebuilt? You know, what, what can you do while it's going on? Because they still have bills to pay, the, the people that are involved in those activities, anything from a hotel owner, somebody that maybe fell, sells uh, fishing supplies, uh, somebody that has a boating operation, you have to find them. Well, have they moved away? Do they move back? And, and so it's a pretty complicated um, situation. And, and it, 
we have to figure out where it is. One of the interesting things, I mentioned the number 15 uh, billion. If, if you look at prior hurricanes that have come through, typically at this point in time in relation to when the hurricane happened till now to where the final number comes out, sometimes those numbers double. You know, so think about that, $30 billion uh, if it gets there. I don't know if it will or not. So it, it's, compl it's, you know, it's co a complicated situation. It's what can we do, how can we help, uh, you know, in part, let's start spending our money in those areas that were uh, affected by that. Uh, you know, look at what can we do, Rockport, Port Aransas. Uh, you, you look at Houston, uh, you know, a couple of folks are here from Houston. Uh, I have a son that lives in Houston. In his area, he said, well, you really can't tell the hurricane even happened now. That's not necessarily the case throughout Houston. And so it's just different areas who's able to do what. And, uh, you know, us as a legislative body will be addressing that. That's very true. And I, whenever I speak about this, a lot of folks, like in an Nacogdoches community, will go, well, why are we talking about the Texas coast? And the reason we're talking about the Texas coast is because it's one of the crown jewels in the tourism inventory in the state. And one out of every four tourism industry jobs is a coastal job. Um, so when those folks are put out of, out of work, when those businesses are displaced, it impacts all of us. It impacts our entire state economy. And it's not just the Texas coast. This is the Midwest United States coast. You know, when I just previous life ran the tourism department in the governor's office, and one of our sweet spots for marketing uh, was always the Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, right up the mid middle of, of the country because our coast was easier for them to get to. And they drive here. They come through communities like Nacogdoches. If we don't give them an opportunity, if we can't get that coastline restored uh, in a way that, in a meaningful way, in a, in a way that's timely, uh, I think a lot of us in this industry are quite concerned that we're going to lose that traffic that we've grown over the years, worked very hard to get here. Um, Representative uh, Gervin Hawkins, my people in San Antonio say all the time, the Corpus in Port Aransas is the San Antonio coast. I mean, it's been, a, it's been an easy drive market for, for folks in, the, in that area. When people come to San Antonio, it's not that big of a deal for them to drive down to, to, to the coast. I mean, what's your, what are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> thank you for that question, first of all, David, and good morning, everyone. Um, I agree. When we think of, of uh, the coastal area, we think of where water is. And so San Antonio in itself, uh, when you have that hour and a half, two hour drive down to the coast, that's where you begin to enjoy you know, the, the, what I, the water side of, of tourism. But you know, San Antonio, I wanted to add, David, is you know, one of those cities that really have prospered because of the tourism industry. Um, when you look at the, the activities in San Antonio, for those of you who've had a great opportunity to visit, there's a lot of things that are happening in the tourism industry. And it is truly my belief that tourism is, is part of the, the, the uh, bedrock of uh, San Antonio's uh, economy, and it's so important. So the coastal area is definitely important uh, to all of that. But uh, in the city itself, if, if you could list all the things that when people come visit San Antonio, the things to do, the activities, the availability uh, of activities, it really happens in San Antonio. And then you can drive to the coastal areas within a short period of time. And you know, go fishing and things like that. And uh, that's a big part uh, of what our San Antonios do, um, is uh, enjoy the coastal area sure, sure. because of the water. Um, I mean, we, we have large land space like most, most of Texas. Uh, we have uh, the theme parks. I mean, think about it. Yeah, who's seen Shamu lately, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, enjoyed all the things that we have, Fiesta Texas, uh, the Alamo, which this session, we were able to get an allocation of $75 million to revamp that whole site to make it something that tour, uh, tourism can enjoy. And I mean, there are so many institutions of memory uh, in the city of San Antonio that, that one can come to, yes. so. Um, from our member standpoint, and all of those coastal communities that we've mentioned so far are TTIA members, so I hear from them quite, quite often. And the number one thing I'm hearing right now that they're saying that, that the state can really help them do 
is get the word out. Yeah. They know they're on a longer timetable to re restore the infrastructure that's there, but the beaches are open. The beaches are, you can go and have a great time on mm -hmm. the beach. But because so many of the hotels were hurt and damaged, the occupancy tax that they were accustomed to coming in to help fund their own promotional efforts is not what it was. Um, and, you know, businesses in that community live for two, two times of the year, yeah. spring break and the summer. And if they don't make a year's worth of revenues over those three and a fourth months, they don't make it for the year. They're exactly. gone. And, you know, um, that's the business side of tourism. A lot of times people think of tourism as just fun places. And I hope as we get into this discussion and we get into those things that impact tourism, you begin to bring what I call the fun stuff together with the business things uh, that occurs. And as we as legislators, when we're making decisions, we want to make sure that we're doing good governance so we don't have unintentional consequences. No doubt those acts of God that we cannot uh, prevent, we could do other things legislatively to help the tourism and strengthen the tourism business. So as, as y'all are sitting here uh, this morning, really start thinking about that business side of the house and how tourism plays into a lot of things. Uh, again, being the second largest economy dr driver in the state of Texas is very vital, very important. So. Absolutely, and promotion is, is key to that. Yeah. And, and we live in a very, it's no longer a domestic market. We live in a global market. Yes. We're competing with countries as a state to get folks to come, to come visit us. Uh, and I think one of the biggest challenges that we saw last legislative session was the state tourism budget was cut in half. And that, we believe, is going to have a domino effect that's going to be very difficult for, for us to recover from. Once you vacate part of the, of the marketplace and, and marketing and advertising, it's very hard to get it back. Ask Colorado, they, they actually cut their, their tourism promotion activity 100% a few years ago. At the time they did that, they were the number one winter resort destination in America. Now they're not even in the top 10. They, all these years later, they still can't crack back in the top 10 because other folks are sitting there ready to fill the space. I'm sure all of you here have run at least one campaign ad over your career. If it didn't work, we wouldn't be doing it. So. I, We've talked about Representative Clardy about how the local occupancy tax was used with, with the uh, Fredonia and how important that is to local communities like a Nacogdoches that maybe can't play in the huge domestic market across the country, so they rely on a state office to do that. Um, and now we have the Senate that's looking at all occupancy tax. And I'm a little concerned about what we're up to there, but that's okay. We'll take a look at it. We'll make our case. What did, from your, anybody on the panel, Representative Parker, let's talk to you because you're the furthest away from me. <laughs> <laughs> your, your area up there does a pretty good job of promoting, promoting itself and, and, and bringing tourism to the area. What do, you, what do you think about the challenges that we have with funding the advertising functions? Well, thank you. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here in Nacogdoches again. I want to thank Travis for uh, his leadership putting this together, and Senator Nichols, uh, it's a privilege to be here again. And uh, I really echo uh, uh, my good friend uh, John Furlow's comments about how uh, the, the lodging has evolved and so how much we enjoyed uh, being in the hotel last night from, from the other lodging that we had in years past. So it is uh, quite extraordinary as a case study to see how the community is developing and addressing the needs of the tourism uh, market here in Texas. But Look, we, we've got obviously real challenges as a state. Um, you know, you heard obviously in, in the earlier comments from John pertaining to what's going on with the rebuilding, obviously, the Gulf Coast. Uh, as a legislative body, we are, of course, committed to uh, what, whatever, as long as it takes to rebuild. It will not be a sprint. It'll be a long-term marathon. And we need to obviously do everything in our power to be proactive and uh, aggressive and being able to support the recovery of that part of the state and obviously the critical economy that is, in fact, the tourism economy. With regard to my region, um, up in Denton County, we're, of course, blessed to have the Texas Motor Speedway. Uh, we've got a lot of great parks. We've got great uh, lakes. Uh, we obviously have amusement parks in the North Texas area, uh, wonderful sports, uh, uh, obviously, uh, programs, and uh, terrific uh, professional uh, teams that participate in the Metroplex as well. And I think it's important that the message for us as legislators to take away is that because we've been blessed historically, we can't sit back on our laurels and think that the 
the great economic abundance that we've had in Texas, particularly in the tourism and visitor space, is going to continue uh, unless we're proactive. So that's really my, I think, takeaway is that we can't just sit back and be content because we've had a great 20-year run, that the next 20 years are going to be equally as good unless we're proactive. Uh, and that means uh, making certain that we've got the tools at our disposal uh, to be successful. Uh, you referenced, David, a moment ago, obviously, what's happened here in the Fredonia Hotel that uh, Travis carried the bill on back in 2015. And we all saw firsthand the direct correlation between good policy and job creation. Uh, look at all of the kids uh, yesterday that had uh, uh, employment opportunities that wouldn't have had six months ago before that uh, property opened up. And so I think it's just always important uh, that we get beyond the rhetoric and we understand the substance of what's really happening. These are powerful tools in our toolbox that we need to utilize to continue to protect and promote Texas. Um, so I think that's a, really the big takeaway for me um, legislatively, and I think also for my area, is that you know, we've utilized these tools. These tools are very important to keeping uh, us vibrant economically. To me, when you talk about tourism, you talk about uh, obviously attracting visitors and so forth, it really goes hand in hand with, broadly speaking, economic development. I mean, it really is just a subset of economic development. It's all interrelated. And so everything that we do, we have to recognize has an implication. Um, you know, look, people aren't going to come to the Dallas-Fort Worth area if they're going to sit in line for two or three hours trying to go from downtown Dallas to go see the Texas Rangers. Uh, or if they're going to uh, go from the Texas Rangers up to the Speedway, it's going to take two or three hours in the area that Craig and I uh, represent kind of the western side of the metro. Why well, they shouldn't go to Dallas. They should just come to Fort Worth or downtown. <laughs> there you go. That's, That's right. exactly right, Craig. <laughs> so my point is, is that, you know, infrastructure issues matter having the opportunity of the right skill set, have the right tools in our, at our disposal that enables uh, the creation of economic opportunity and job creation is very important. It's all, at the end of the day, as I said earlier, interconnected, and we've got to recognize that. Representative Goldman, next door neighbors. Fort Worth. We're next door neighbors. Uh, they may not have a city with a stronger brand than Fort Worth. There, I, I would argue there is not one in Texas, especially right now, all that's going on in Fort Worth. Uh, we are growing immensely, the state demographer uh, suggests that in the next 20 or 30 years we're going to have a higher, in Tarrant County, going to have a higher population than Dallas County. So all the development in North Texas, not all, but a majority of development is in North Texas is happening in Fort Worth. And lo and behold, it's happening in my district. Uh, district 97, I'm in the southwest quadrant of Tarrant County. And believe it or not, uh, we have plenty of land for development. And we just broke ground about a month ago on Tarleton State University. Tarleton is, as many of you know, is based in Stephenville, Texas. They're coming to Fort Worth. They're coming to my district. Um, they're going to, they, they have students there now, but they're scattered throughout the city. They finally are going to have a main campus, the first public college in the city of Fort Worth. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, that will be, um, uh, on, they'll, they'll be, uh, students will be in their campus in the next year. Uh, first of all, I'd be remiss to tell you all not to, uh, to, to please come to Fort Worth. Um, especially come uh, to the pride of District 97, the Fort Worth Zoo, one of the top five zoos in the nation. Uh, they just moved the giraffes two weeks ago to the new African um, safari exhibit, multi-million dollar new um, area of the zoo. And uh, if you haven't ever seen a baby gorilla, Gus uh, was born about two years ago, and there's nothing cuter than a baby gorilla. Um, every single time the, uh, the zoo tweets out that <clears throat> a new animal was born, I retweet it and say, well, I have a new constituent in House District 97. <laughs> um, but but one, one thing that we did pass several sessions ago, speaking of um, uh, hotel tax fees and public-private partnerships, uh, those of you been to Fort Worth or been to the rodeo and been to Will Rogers Coliseum, and it perhaps a uh, glorious, glorious building, but perhaps a little outdated. So it's been on the books for many years for us to build a new arena in Fort Worth. And several sessions ago, Chairman Guerin uh, carried legislation for us to uh, use the hotel occup occupancy tax in a unique way. <clears throat> and I believe it was a two, three mile radius uh, within the new Coliseum's area would get uh, a little extra hit on their occupancy tax. But that is going to generate millions of dollars. Uh, the private sector uh, matched those funds and now has even increased uh, some of those funds. And the new Dickies Arena is being built as we speak. And talk about not only hundreds of jobs, 
uh, that's going to be affected when that new arena uh, opens in a year. Um, but they already have commitments of the NCAA Final Four, not the Final Four, but the, one of the first round games. Um, the uh, NCAA Gymnastics Women's Championship will be there. Uh, we're going to compete with American Airlines in Dallas for concerts and, and many other things that will come that, frankly, the old arena could not handle. Um, so that was a very unique way that, uh, um, and thank all my fellow members for helping to pass that piece of legislation because it needed to come through the, to, through the legislature to do so. Awesome. Representative Bales, your, your district is probably more like the Nacogdoches area than the other members sitting here. Tell us a little bit about, about District 18 and what tourism promotion means for you and your area. We've got a lot of broad diversity in House District 18. We represent three counties, Liberty, San Jacinto, and Walker County. Um, we've got Sam Houston State University. We've got a lot of very positive growth there in the Huntsville area. We have a fairly uh, sizable uh, number of constituents in a gated community called TDCJ, which definitely changes the dynamics of the district <laughs> quite a bit. Um, my home county, we have, we're 80% forested. So we're definitely Southeast Texas. We also have the second largest lake in the state of Texas, and on that lake in San Jacinto County, there's not a single place where you can actually rent a motorized boat. Growth is inevitable. We have that coming, but then again, I think we have to do all of our powers to step back, take a very proactive approach, and make sure that that growth is positive. We have the 99 Grand Central Parkway is actually coming through Liberty County. In that area, we have a small logging community called Plum Grove, Texas. Population 640 at the last census. Now we have over 19,000 five acre, 500 half acre platted lots, and they're fixing to develop several thousand more. And it's a very different demographic that's been brought in. It's low socioeconomic, predominantly Hispanic, and then you look at the impact of our public school systems. You already have a failing school system, which has been rated unacceptable several occasions. You have this huge influx of additional students, how can that be addressed in a positive manner? So you look at those different challenges, how you embrace that, but then again, you also look at the impact of Harvey, that was one of the original questions, and how, how that changes tourism. I think the one scope that we've completely missed is of all the families that were directly impacted, they no longer have that disposable income to actively vacation like they could before. So they're going to be thinking about that in a very different way. I had the opportunity as part of the, part of the Committee on Land and Resource Management, we got to go tour Rockport, Fulton, Port Aransas, Aransas Pass. A lot of those places were completely decimated. You look at the hotels where people usually stay, some are no longer there in near the same capacity that they were before, but then again, you look at the broader scope of support staff, your public schools. I think there was over, in, in Fulton and Rockport, one of those schools in December, over 70% of the students were still homeless. Even if you're able to open those hotels back up, you're able to open those services, do you have the support staff that is there? And then again, when you have other places in the state that were directly impacted, do they have the available funds that they're not having to spend on sheetrock, replacing furniture, and just getting their lives back together to go, to go do that? So we're in a different situation. We don't have the Alamo. We don't have zoos. We don't have a whole lot there in our more rural areas. But I think it's always important that we look and we know that this growth is coming. Houston, Texas is starting to absorb my district where I live. We're in exactly an hour north. We have a, where I live, it's surrounded by the National Forest. There's two Walmarts within 15 minutes, and we're 42 miles from Bush Intercontinental Airport. That would be considered ruled by most. However, we have access to all of that. And then you look at, as we have that available land, predominantly in the timber industry, those large tracts of land, every time you see one of those tracts of land that is up for sale, you always have to keep at the back of your mind what growth is going to happen there. And does this particular county have the parameters in place to restrict how that growth is going to be done? We have developments that are building several thousand homes with zero building restrictions whatsoever and zero infrastructure in place in order to control what is built there, make sure that they have their permits and how that progresses. Liberty County alone, they actually had to put an absolute freeze on all, lot, on all developments 
before they would approve any more developments and make sure that they had those parameters put in place. So we're at a very different place in time as far as tourism goes and the economic development. However, it's, I think it's more detrimental to our rural areas to make sure that we be mindful of that broader picture so that that growth that we have is positive. We don't have, we don't have a lot of the other draws. We have nature. And that is one thing that I think everyone is coming back to as we became such an urban society and everyone's been raised and there are more and more generations removed from the family farm, ranches, rural areas. A lot of people are trying to get back to that. So I think that is going to become a more important part of the tourism industry as this progresses. I think you're exactly right with that. And I think when we look at what the demographic is and the travel, the preferences of the new generation of traveler, I'm a baby boomer. I still got a little money, but they're not as interested in me, okay? Everybody's got their focus on a younger generation at 45 and, and younger. Um, and communities, I, I personally believe, communities like your district, uh, this is a, a real opportunity for them to communicate because in the age of social media, it's cheap to promote in many areas like that. I mean, you, you can reach, this is where these folks live. They live on social media. I mean, they take their, their iPhones, their smartphones, they don't travel with them, they do business on them. They're, they're transactional devices. They're navigational devices. And we don't need roadmaps anymore. Who needs that? You got Siri, okay? Um, but these folks, they love the Airbnb model, okay? And they love the Ubers and the Lyfts. I think you folks just got Uber here in Nacogdoches, right? Not too long ago. Travis is a driver. What is this world coming to? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, but but this, this new generation of travelers, they, they have money, but they have a deeper appreciation for sense of place and authenticity of a destination than any generation before them. They want to come and they want to live in your, visit your community as you live in your community. And so I think when you look at resource-strapped communities or communities that don't have an Alamo, Representative Herman <laughs> Hawkins, um, I mean, these, these are ways that we can attract these folks to our communities. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't take a huge amount of money to begin to play that game. And, and, and when those tax dollars come in, obviously, they help with a, with a, with a populace that isn't quite as, as demographically rich as some of the others. Um, so I think that's, and we'll talk a little bit more about this new emerging types of what we call entrepreneurship. We think we're an industry where that, that type of activity really thrives. Um, but if y'all don't matter, I want to pivot a little bit back to Representative Gervin Hawkins and follow up on some companion remarks that Representative Parker and Goldman made about big events. You just had a final four in your city, Representative. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. I got to go. It was awesome. What do you think? <laughs> You want to do it again? No doubt about it. <laughs> you know, when you think of San Antonio, and as, as I was listening to my colleagues, uh, and we talk about tourism, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't mention, you know, i.e. the Coliseum. For those of you who've come to the rodeo, you know, one of the largest events in the country, basically, at the rodeo. And I didn't mention, you know, because I don't like to be braggadocious here, uh, about our beautiful San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, braggadocious. <laughs> uh, so there, there's many attractions in San Antonio, and it is it has become a place of a real destination of major events. Uh, when I think about the growth over the past uh, 30 years in San Antonio, it has been tremendous. Because for a long time, we didn't even have a thousand room hotel. And that was, you know, as we began to think about tourism and, and the, the impact on economics, and we think of the, the, the tools that we have available to us to make things happen, you know, you think about a, a city as large as San Antonio not having a thousand room hotel to attract conventions and other things like that. But we're on the move. I mean, we just built a convention center uh, to the tune of over $300 million, uh, which is just fabulous. Uh, and I think of our downtown, it has transformed so tremendously. I feel a little guilty because we haven't really suffered a lot from the adverse things that have occurred. The, the, the city continues to grow. So the Final Four was one of those events 
that, uh, you know, that was not only uh, appropriate for San Antonio, but, you know, it, it had the venues that were available to it, i.e. the Alamo Dome, and I need to put a little plug in. Uh, they came to the Gervin Center, which I was once CEO of, and, and, and the teams had practiced there. There's three college-sized gymnasiums. And so it was just wonderful to see the NBA academies. So when we think of the Final Four, it's not just the universities, but the NBA has done some awesome things as it relates to their international relationships. And I had a great opportunity to speak with one of the NBA execs. And my thought was, what's happening with the NBA and the international market? So as we talk about our new entrepreneurs and folks like that, as y'all know, the world has become a little smaller. You know, we're not no longer just within our geographic footprint, but we're also looking at the international market. So I need to tell y'all the story about uh, the NBA and how it got involved uh, so heavy in the international market. So the story I was told is that Yao Ming, who came to Houston, Texas, I remember the seven-footer basketball player, for those of you who are sports folks, came to um, Houston, Texas to play ball. Prior to Yao Ming coming to Houston, there was zero uh, market uh, in that area, in the Asian market in China. And that market went from zero to a billion dollar industry, a billion dollars. So now the NBA, they said after Yao Ming left, there was no other athlete of that caliber. So they decided they're gonna grow that type of athlete. So now they have the NBA academies uh, in all these countries where they're now growing these, what I call international athletes. So most of the teams, as you can see, have more international players. But the NBA have found a true sweet spot as it relates to the international market. And so, I mean, we're talking 14-year-olds who's seven feet, you know. <laughs> I, I walk into the gym, I felt like I was in a forest of trees, <laughs> you know. But uh, the, the Final Four was great. It, it generated a lot of revenue. Uh, we were able to accommodate it, and it brought a lot of attention to the city. And we will continue to try to attract activities that bring that level of economic impact. So, you know, when you think about tourism, it has to be really intentional and deliberate and focused when you talk about making it work for you. Uh, I'm a big believer that it's one of those markets that even though other things may go down, tourism can continue to rise because I think all of us need to have fun every now and then and uh, invest in, in, in what I call those, those areas that are non-traditional um, uh, business areas, but those areas that, that bring the families together. I mean, to see all the families, all the teams, all the activity, we're talking walking streets, walking downtown. I mean, it was just really unbelievable of what was happening during that time. You know, we've experienced the championship teams quite a bit, so it's not new to San Antonio. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> You know, we've had the great pleasure of having five championships. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, that, uh, that whole idea of the tourism, we, we've been blessed, yes. truly blessed, uh, to have enjoyed that. And, and uh, I think we're worthy of it. What do you think, Rev Clardy? <laughs> so maybe the next final four we could have uh, down here in Nacogdoches? Yeah, <laughs> build, build another new hotel. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it, it does. You, you make a great point, and, and I'm told by the folks in San Antonio that it was a hundred and eighty million dollar economic yeah. impact, second only to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and we just did that little thing in Houston last year, right? Yeah. Um, and so we keep, and I'm sure you know that for communities that live around the shoulders of those big metro areas, I mean, there there is economic rollover that happens. But it seems like every session, somebody wants to go after this thing called, and it's the most misappropriately named program I can think of, um, Events Trust Fund. First off, there's no fund, okay? There's no pot of money sitting there. I talked to a legislator one time and said, I want to kill the Events Trust Fund. We're going to zero that balance out. 
I was like, well, happy hunting, okay? Because <laughs> that the way that works is basically if you want to host one of these big events, you, you, you send an application to the governor's office, you project what the economic impact of that will be, and then the incremental increases in tax revenue, various tax revenues that come in as a result of that are refunded to you from the state. It's not sitting there in a pot waiting to happen. It has to be earned first, and if the event doesn't earn it, guess what? You don't get it. But it has been a great economic development tool recruiting these major events across the state. Are we going to have to fight tooth and nail to hang on to that, that program one more time this next session? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, <laughs> you. I, I, you know, if we do, we do. But to me, it's worth fighting for. And uh, I want to thank some of my colleagues that were supportive of uh, allowing this last session uh, the ability for me to work to expand, if you will, the list of eligible events for NASCAR. Um, and again, as we talked about earlier, at the end of the day, it, we always want to take care of Texas. We want to represent our districts. Um, and we were, had the ability to expand uh, uh, a couple of eligible races for NASCAR. To me, that's great economic development. It, it brings, obviously, uh, tourism. It brings folks from all over uh, Texas, all over the United States uh, to our area, just as we talked about uh, the impact of a Final Four. And so that Major Events Trust, in my mind, has been a very important tool and will continue to be going forward. And, you know, the reality is, is that we need to look at all the different things that uh, are benefiting uh, from that. So it's obviously Super Bowls. It's obviously a World Series. It's, it's Final Fours. Uh, it's, uh, frankly, a Republican National Convention uh, to come to Texas or a Democrat National Convention. I mean, all those kinds of major big ticket items that will grow our economy and create uh, visitors coming to Texas, I think, are important. So it really, in my mind, is something that is definitely worth fighting for going forward, Dave. Thank you. Um, our industry, and don't forget, if you have questions, raise your hand. We have cards over here so that you can submit your questions to our panelists. Um, I think we're doing okay on time. A um, couple of issues I wanted to talk about before we, our time does run out. Our industry is 70 percent small business. Uh, so while we have big corporations and, you know, Dallas Cowboys, American Airlines, all that, it's still the small business folks that are the heart and soul of who we are as an industry. They create more of our jobs than anybody else, any other type of business. And it seems like we, we're in an age where many of our businesses in many of the metro areas and some of the other areas across the state are kind of butting heads with their local governments on regulations and things. I mean, you see some cities who are, you know, some of them want um, mandatory increases in minimum wage. Some of them say, you know, this ban the box thing where when you're interviewing for, for employees, you can't ask if they have a criminal record. Um, there are others that say you have to give so many paid days of sick leave. Well, I mean, for a small business person, and, and particularly someone that is, you know, a DBA or an LLC, that can be a difference maker whether you get started or don't get started. I mean, and we've seen the, the legislature interject on these, uh, in, in, into these type of issues as related to short-term rentals, the Airbnb market, the Uber market, all that kind of stuff. Do we see these kind of things? Do we anticipate the legislature will step in on, on a lot of these other municipal type regulations that are being implemented and passed? Anyone? Well. <laughs> Please, please, not everybody at the same time. <laughs> I, for, for me, I think a lot of it is local. We're having lots of conversation around the Airbnb, particularly how it impacts our communities. You know, if you have the older communities with the big homes, you know, how do we regulate that? I don't think that's necessarily a state issue. I think we're looking at some of this being local. You know, as a new legislator, one of the things I've learned uh, pretty pretty uh, quickly is that folks want to legislate everything and I think a lot of times we've got to hear the voices of our local community so um, you know the the idea of Uber, Lyft, you know Airbnb, all these new innovative things I think we can only do so much and uh, the local communities have to get engaged you know so what do you think uh, Mr. Chair? Good, good, good answer. <laughs> now, I think it's interesting. What you have to do is look at each uh, item by itself. Of course, uh, Chairman Parker had a bill last session on uh, the, the Airbnbs, I believe. And, uh, you know, I'll let, defer to him to talk about that. But if, if you look at the other items, uh, school start dates, items like that, 
Uh, sometimes they can be local, sometimes they can't be. I think what you have to look at, and I've looked at this on uh, bills that I've filed in the past, is how do people around the state and around the country react? And if you have to figure out what each jurisdiction has and how it operates, and it, it causes problems, and that may be something that we need to look at at the state level. Uh, as you said, the Uber, uh, Lyft, uh, part of that's technology. And one of the, the biggest problems we have in uh, uh, Austin is, as a legislative body is keeping up with technology. I've spent a lot of time working on human trafficking items. And uh, you know, one of the things we have to balance is privacy, our right to privacy with uh, people's ability to use technology you know, to trap kids, to uh, uh, do bad things to kids. And so as we make more information available, we have new items available, we as individuals, uh, David, you had said on our phone. We sit there and all of us uh, use our phone for business, we use it for fun. We uh, kind of go crazy if we, we lost our phone. We don't know what to do. How, how do we get caught up? But we also, there's a balance there. And so we have to look at how do we protect kids while uh, well, protecting privacy. And I think the same thing works with whether it's Airbnb, whether it's Lyft, how some of those items work. Uh, getting back to the start date of school. Well, as you said, a lot of the business in the tourism industry happens right at the end before school starts. People want to get out. They want to have that final fling before they have to pack up the kids and send them to school to get away. And as the school dates move up, then that has a huge effect on tourism, the dollars. Uh, you know, different companies pay their kids bonuses. You know, I say kids, they're uh, employees bonuses to stay on a certain time so that they have employees and staff up to the end of their season and so we have to look at that and see how you know where is it going uh, one of the things that bothers me as a business owner and I own a small business is the minimum or the sick days mm -hmm. You know, there again, there's a balance, but oftentimes, as well as minimum wage, I think we need to look at that and let the marketplace determine what works, not have a group of people uh, sitting there uh, in different jurisdictions coming up saying, okay, this is what you're going to do, and this is what we're going to say. When, you know, some of them probably have never signed a paycheck on the front. And it's kind of irritating to those of us that have, you know, that, that I don't say have to, get the opportunity to do that, to pay people. And we're doing the best we can to employ people, to take care of them. They're part of our family. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes in, once you get it set up, once you've made the investment in that business, and they say, okay, you're going to start doing this. We're going to tell you how much you're going to pay your people, what type of sick leave they have, what type of vacation they have, and take everything else, uh, you know, they, they toss it aside. And I think that's when we, uh, as a legislative body, need to get involved when, when you have that type of activity. We listen to our constituents. If not, we don't get elected. You know, it's not up to us to come here. It's up to the folks back in our district to vote for us. They want us to support the things they want. And uh, I think that uh, the, the sick time is one of those things that just makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hit on that and echo one thing. Being a, a rural member, the legislative body is predominantly composed of individuals from more of your urban, more densely populated areas. We always have to be mindful of the negative unintended consequence of the one-size-fits-all approach. We are, I mean, Representative uh, Hawkins talks about San Antonio, I mean, very fortunate with a thriving tourism industry and not until recently had a thousand room hotel occupancy at one single location. In my home county, we have Camp Strake, the Boy Scout Camp, which is moving from Montgomery County, and now that's going into a residential development, and that's coming to right there in a, uh, on an old timber tract in San Jacinto County. We don't have a single hotel which is of a chain or name brand in the entire county. So the regulations that we pass as a legislative body, it's very difficult that they factor in San Antonio, Houston, DFW Metroplex and still take care of those rural areas. And even in my district, we have Huntsville. Huntsville is very different than other parts of our district. We're very fortunate we were able to pass this last session with the uh, 
Sam Houston Republic of Texas Presidential Library, and we have talks of a presidential triangle there in Huntsville to be coupled with the industry that they already have as well as the university and other aspects. But then again, just right down the road, like I said, we have this inherent growth and we don't even have the hotel occupancy to be able to house those people who come to be part of that event. So that's one thing that I think it's always very important. And because we have so few, so few rural members, it's important that we be ever so diligent and work with, I mean, we've got a very strong East Texas uh, delegation with uh, Representative Clardy and a lot of the other members here that we all have to band together, be conscious of what we're doing and look at how it's gonna affect our constituent base and our local businesses back at home. I'm going to just comment and, and, you know, obviously I think we've already had a great discussion on this issue already, but, you know, every one of these items that comes before us has to be looked at on its own merits. Um, you know, and, and the most difficult thing that we do as lawmakers is trying to find that balance between uh, providing local control and at the same time allowing uh, innovation and free enterprise to take place and to have a level playing field. That's obviously essential for us to have a, a strong small business uh, economy and our ability to attract uh, tourism uh, from uh, folks uh, all over the world. Um, in particular, was referenced the bill that I carried last uh, session with regard to short-term rentals. Uh, I thought that was a prime example where it was important that we uh, municipalities had uh, gone too far in blocking, if you will, some of the short-term rentals. Um, and that's the reason why uh, Senator Hancock and I uh, were involved in working on that bill last session. Uh, much like we really, all of us legislatively passed the, the improvement or the fix to the situation with Uber, uh, in Austin. Uh, I think we all felt like Austin had gone too far in blocking Uber, um, and, and therefore we thought it was important for, again, the free market to step in and allow uh, Uber to be successful. So each of these situations is different. You've got to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but, but I think at the end of the day, you know, again, trying to get it right to find the right balance between where does the state weigh in versus allowing, obviously, for local control, uh, it probably is no more challenging issue that any of us as legislators face. Awesome. Last topic I wanted to talk about, I'll just throw out there and we can, yes or no, uh, with the property tax uh, reform, are we going to get a 25% consumption tax? <laughs> I, I'll throw up. Probably not this session. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. But you know, that gives us session. the willies of the tourism industry because we're <laughs> yes. all consumption. That's, yeah. You know, we're, we're price points <laughs> with the consumers. So. Okay, we'll let that one go. We had, a couple, <laughs> Everyone sees it. we had a couple of questions from the audience. One of these is, yeah. wow, this is a really good thinking question. We've talked about uh, the large events and how great that is for the cities that host them. Um, however, there are long-term problems that can occur. For example, cities that host Olympics have negative impact after the event due to unused facilities. What checks and balances does the state have in place to ensure large events with potential for huge economic impacts don't cost more in the end due to the aftermath of the event? And how are we encouraging sustainability through these events? Anybody want to? Well, I mean, I think that's the, the process that we have in place. I mean, we're talking about really about major events trust. You obviously have a process by which you go through the application process with the governor. You have to have a, items that are eligible and so uh, in the first place. And so I think that's really where the dialogue and the discourse on these kind of things takes place is that You've got to make a decision whether or not this is good economic development long term or not. Um, and every situation, again, is, is unique in that regard. So, but I think we're mindful of that. Uh, and I think thus far uh, over the history of that major events trust, um, I think it's been incredibly successful. It's brought so many wonderful things to Texas. It's uh, grown our economy. It's been great for job creation. Uh, and I think, frankly, not only for folks that have come from all over uh, the world and all over the United States has been beneficial, but it's been great for Texans. It's been, a, it's been an improvement in our quality of life for Texans uh, to have access to these extraordinary type of events. And what I'd like to add, because we had it, what I call uh, a big elephant, which was the Alamo Dome. Um, when the Alamo Dome was built, it had a certain usage. That usage died down. And so it takes your local leadership to look at not only just the short term, but the long term benefits. And so about three years ago, uh, with the Alamo Dome which sits in my district was vacant for a long time, had minimum usage, a few concerts, but yet it was costing the taxpayers a lot of money. 
So what happened was the city partnered with uh, UTSA and the Alamo Dome became the, the home football site of the uh, football games for UTSA. So there can be and should be those strategies focused around not only just the short term and the event, but what happens after that event is gone? What is the long-term usage of those facilities that could potentially sit in communities and become eyesores if they're not eventually used? Mm -hmm. So it really comes down, again, to local leadership thinking short-term and long-term. But Dave, one thing I'd like to add, too, as we you know, focus not just on that question, but I'd like for the folks in this room to remember the school start window, because that's an issue that gets kind of overlooked and how it impacts the local community. And you've got different points of views on the school start window. We do know this, the state of Texas pays for 180 days in education. How should those days be placed? We should be thinking about big picture, not just um, one situation, but how we are impacting our uh, economy. Because you think about it, when those kids go back early, uh, our tourism industry is immensely impacted. And so we've got to have, start having those conversations because from the educator perspective, they've got their viewpoint on what should happen. Then you've got the parents and you've got uh, the business folks and then you've got the industries. So I think overall, the, the biggest thing I'd like to leave with y'all today is that tourism is big. We need it. Now let's talk about how we manage it in a way that we, uh, is, it becomes a positive effort for most of our communities. Can I touch yes, on something sir. since uh, it's been brought up a couple of times about the school start date. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the school end date. Uh, I made the mistake of using common sense and legislation uh, for the last two sessions, something that's very difficult to do. Um, I tour my public schools every single uh, fall prior to session beginning to talk to principals, teachers, and students uh, since we impact their lives, uh, I think it's extremely beneficial to go listen to them to hear what's on their minds to see what problems we can solve. Uh, one of the great ideas, I thought, uh, common sense was, uh, let's have the end of the school year be the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we come back uh, after Memorial Day, we're here for two or three days, we put on movies for the kids to watch, basically we're just babysitters for the last three, four days of school. Uh, so I introduced that bill strictly not knowing the battles uh, that have been waged for many years um, and was told, first and foremost, don't touch, you can mess with the end date, but do not touch or mess with the start date. Uh, but I was amazed uh, when I, I, I didn't get a hearing my first, uh, the two sessions ago, but I got a hearing last session. And I was amazed how much the tourism uh, world, uh, we didn't even promote it, we didn't ask anyone to come testify. Uh, we thought we were going to be there for a two-minute hearing. The hearing probably went on 30 minutes to an hour because of the tourism industry that came out in favor of the bill so that they knew, and many of the camps knew, they could start you know, June 1. So um, I'm, I'm going to propose that again this next session and hope we make move. I will not touch the start date. But it, again, it just makes sense to have well, we will, uh, Friday will, before Memorial Day. Weekend. I will offer food for thought on the start date. I would be <laughs> remiss and probably would be lashed if I got home and didn't. Um, just food for thought. When, and I'm going to use Houston as an example for another reason, the Representative Bales is here and you live on the shoulder of Houston. What is it, six million people or something in the, in the metro area? Um, when, when the Houston school districts set a start date, that let's say it's early August, let's say the first week in August. UIL programs now have kids coming back into school mid-July. That takes what we used to have a fourth Monday in August, and now the school districts, local control, are setting their own school districts, their school start days. That takes six million, potentially six million, however many, people out of the travel market that, they, that could come to your district. That you could have an extra month's worth of economic activity in your district. So from our perspective, it's not really a local control issue because what is made here as a local decision impacts others all across the state. So it's a statewide issue. It's something that needs to be looked at, with, I think, through that lens. And 
If you file that bill from the, on the start date, I absolutely am certain we'll be there supporting you once again. Uh, the last question I got from the, from the uh, group here today was, how was spring break on the coast? And I will tell you, encouragingly, it was very good. Um, lots of people showing up on the coast for spring break. The problem is there weren't a lot of businesses open and there weren't a lot of hotels and, and, and you know, other accommodations available. So the economic footprint that it's going to leave is not typical. But it was good to see Texans and non-Texans back on the coast again. It, it, if nothing else, it was a shot of some much needed economic impact for those communities. And psychologically, it's the next step toward recovery for them. Thank all of these panelists for being here today. What a great job. What good supporters we have for the industry. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, panelists. Uh, one thing I'm always proud of when we do this, I sit here and list these folks, I guess with the exception of Frulo, I'm always impressed by the, the things that they have to say and their knowledge and expertise. But uh, thank you all for coming to the Nacogdoches and being part of this program. Uh, you know, Barbara, she doesn't want to leave. If you want to stay on the next panel, we'll just leave you where you are. Uh, I, I love this, love this lady. She is a special member. It, it was a great addition to the Texas legislature. You know, uh, she's earned a couple of nicknames. Of course, you know her brother, George Gervin, the Ice Man. So the Ice Woman cometh. And, uh, but but um, I love to refer to her as the Silver Fox. <laughs> she does a great job. So 